Okay. And uh, we're just going to jump into this uh, straight up. So we are, uh, I'm going to shrink the No, where are we going? So Nick, what did you tell Randy and Bishop? Like, do you want them to join? Yeah, I was just, I was just copied the link. Unless you want to send it to them. No, could you just send it to Mark Bishop? Okay. Thanks. You can keep talking. All right, here we go. I'm going to fade you guys out so I can only see myself. So if you want to ask a question, just jump in. Just turn your microphones off and jump in. So uh, a little bit about who I am, in case you don't know. I am from New Zealand. I trained in Australia, lived in Chile. I came to California in 1989 and became the winemaker at Simi Winery in 1990. And we were owned by Louis Vuitton. Uh, I looked after the still wines around the world for Louis Vuitton. So Cloud, um, Cloudy Bay, Cape Mantel in Australia, Rafino in Italy, Terrasas in Argentina, Roses in Portugal, etc. And then we were sold to Constellation. I was the chief winemaker for Icon Estates when Constellation was a lot smaller. I left Simi, the only job I changed in uh, 2003 and went to run Allo de Mec. We owned 58, they owned 58 wineries in seven countries. So I ran all the still wine operations for Allo de Mec and then we were sold to Jim Beam. So I ran Jim Beam. And then we got sold to Constellation, so I got my job back. So in 2008, I went out on my own. And the, and the thing, what we, in 2008, if you recall, was a very tragic time in the wine industry. The large corporations were reducing the number of growers that they had. And I had a call from a number of my friends who were growers saying, we've got no route to market. So what I wanted to do was set up a number of individual brands uh, and, to, and help these growers out. So we pay the growers a really good price. Like uh, I could probably get the grapes a lot cheaper, but I want to make sure these guys stay in business. And, uh, you know, I've been working with them for such a long time. So hence, Set in Stone is one of those vineyards. So we'll look at that vineyard. And then the Zinfandel uh, comes, sorry, the Cabernet and Chardonnay both come from the same vineyard in uh, just north of, of, of where I am in Healdsburg. So we'll, we'll talk about that. And I've been buying grapes from here, from this vineyard since 1990. The Zinfandel that's also on the property uh, now goes to Segacio. So they did get rid of, they did manage to sell those grapes, but we take the rest for um, set in stone. So a little bit of a look where we are. This is um, where I'm sitting right now in the town of Healdsburg. This is where I live out in Dry Creek. Healdsburg's an amazing place for those, you guys know it because you're all in the North Bay, but what we're, where we're sitting right here is, is right on the edge of Alexander Valley and Russian River. This is Dry Creek. Alexander Valley goes this way, of course. Uh, Chalk Hill is to the east and then Russian River is to the south. If you go up uh, Healdsburg Avenue uh, here, you'll, uh, you'll end up in this, this is where Simi basically is. If you go past Simi Winery, you take the first road on the right here and you cruise on down. It's five miles down to the, the vineyard that we're talking about. The piece of property that we're going to be focused on or the blocks that we're going to be focused on is this piece here, which is the Cabernet, and this piece here, which is the Chardonnay. This property here is Pete Segacio's um, uh, home ranch. Remember, this the Pasolac was owned this whole valley. And it's a massive valley, but the Petrocellis, the Mazzonis, the Foppianos, and the Segacios all married into the Pasolacquas. You know what Italian families are like. And so the property was broken up. Today, uh, the property that I work on is this one. This is uh, uh, Donna Pasolacqua. This is Fred Pasolacqua. And as I said, this is Segacio. But if we, if we did the whole valley, you would see the other families as well. The reason for the name is, uh, and this is not a posed site, they, they uh, pull the stones out of the uh, out of the middle avenue because it makes it difficult for the tractors to drive and they put them under the, under the vine here. So um, uh, that's where the name comes from. But secondly, as, as uh, Bob knows and your um, other friends do, is that I have uh, gradually started to move the Chardonnay into more and more concrete ferments. We've been making wine and concrete since 1982, well I have anyway. And uh, so 
set in stone is is perhaps it fits as well for um for for the Chardonnay discussion as well. These are the labels that you've you've obviously seen. I didn't realise that um, the this emblem, of course, is in the uh, this the uh, New Orleans uh, football team, and uh, but the name set in stone. So this is the vineyard. You can see that the Cabernet block here is quite diverse. You can see we've got nice dark green vines here. We have um, uh, sort of something in between here, and then we have thinner canopy here. We'll show a little drone in a little minute. This block down here is the Chardonnay. This is the 100 year, 120 year old Zinfandel that you may have heard of that Pizza Gaucio makes a wine called San Leandro. San, Le, San Leandro, oh, I forget what the name is, San Leandro, which is his $100 bottle of wine. And then uh, this piece here is Zinfandel and then this is Merlot too. If you ever wanted to do a Merlot, we get this Merlot as well. So uh, a, a future opportunity. The key things for me on Chardonnay, talking about that first, is uh, this is a mass selection, which I'll talk a little bit about. We cane prune it, which uh, means that the shoots are very open and, and further apart than if we were spur pruning. So most vineyards these days are spur pruned. It's east facing, which means we get morning sun. Morning sun is more interesting than afternoon sun because we don't get the heat. And uh, in the winery, we'll talk a little bit about malolactic and what my my version of that but basically it's native native ferment we ferment mainly in concrete and we don't make any additions and the wine is vegan so it has the four v's it's vineyard vintage varietal and vegan if you want to it makes it pretty easy hey nick goldschman here i'm standing out here in one of our vineyards and i thought that i'd just show you the difference between a split horizontal split and what we look for in our new vineyards, which is new positioning. We're moving more and more away from this sort of architecture because we have to make bigger cuts. And this is what we used to call spur pruning, or we call spur pruning. And with big cuts, we get more utopia. On this side, sorry. We're moving more to this as we get global warming. This makes it more interesting for us. I only make smaller cuts, I don't get so much disease. I can prune a little bit later, so we've got the sap running, and then the buds push a little bit later in the season. So it's delaying maturity, and that's what we have to do as we go into global warming. Anyway, I'm gonna do a quick couple of videos on comparing pruning of these two types. Stay tuned. Nick Goldschmidt here. I'm here to discuss the difference in spur pruning and cane pruning. And this is an example of spur pruning. This is the spur that was left last year. It's a two bud spur. We had two shoots coming out of that. And this is what we call a water shoot or a non-count shoot. So I'm actually going to take this one off this year. I'm going to take the spur off and I'm going to come back to two positions. So that's the way we prune a spur position vineyard. G'day, Nick Goldschmidt here. I'm here to talk about cane pruning. This is the way we prune these days. This is much more tricky than spur pruning. It takes a little bit more intelligence. So what we do is we take off uh, from fruit from last year. I'm looking for two canes to lay down. So I'm taking off some of the uh, canes that we don't want for this year. I've got two that are identified. I leave a two bud spur position as a replacement spur in case I run into problems next year. So these will be the, the two canes that I lay down for the season. As you can see, it takes a little longer to pull all the water out and you have to have a, a fairly good IQ and understanding what the architecture of a vineyard is gonna look like. I will be laying these two canes down for the vintage. So yeah, quite a, it's it, the advantage of, of spur pruning, of course, it's a lot faster. Even Australians can do it. And the advantage of cane pruning is that you don't do a lot more work during the season. So the cane pruning takes a longer, but we have more labor at winter during the pruning season, but we have less labor available to do suckering and leaf removal and everything else like that, which is so important when we, when we have to deal with um, uh, 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 spur pruning. Uh, 2018 was one of the, you know, very similar to 2013, both very good vintages, uh, but basically 14, 15, 16, 17, they've all been pretty good. 2012, of course, was the 10 out of 10, the 12 out of 10 vintage. 
the um, but we've had a pretty good run now. The 2019 was also similar, and then 2020, it looks like we're heading back into a drought season, although we've had a bit of rain here in the last couple of days, but certainly nothing. We think we'll get about an inch uh, next week, which will be good, but we're still only about one third, 30% of uh, normal. And I hope you guys in the North Bay here are doing everything you can to conserve water for us poor agricultural guys. Uh, this is a look at the vineyard, the, um, the Chardonnay vineyard. You can see it's a very old vineyard. There's um, some vines that are missing. And that's the Russian River. And if you were to drive from here to there without getting, without going through the river, it would take about uh, 40 minutes to, because you've got to go all the way back in Healdsburg around Fitch Mountain and then come back out the other side. So it's uh, a beautiful location. And it's really interesting. If you notice this, and this is, I don't know of any other place that you can talk about this with, except with set in stone. This is the only wine, the only vineyard that, it's the, it's the Chardonnay and Cabernet are in the same vineyard and they're in different appellations. So this is the Russian River appellation. Uh, this little ditch here, this is Russian River and this is Alexander Valley. So it's a really unique opportunity. You can talk about single vineyard with this wine and yet it's in two different appellations. So really cool. So let's talk about the, the reason why um, set in stone is different, the Chardonnay is different. It's because we have these old field selections. So I just want to back up a little bit and make sure you guys understand because it's a key selling element for me. Pre-prohibition, of course, everything was randomly planted. The Italians came over and they planted the Zinfandel with the Carrigan with the Movedra with the, you know, with the Sinso and everything, everything was mixed because that was the way they did it in Italy. Um, then uh, we had prohibition, of course, and, and, and then 1933, we had this varietal explosion. So after prohibition, people started doubt, delving into making wines of a certain variety. And I still have a, a wine from 1934, Simi. Simi was one of the original, so there was five original wineries in Sonoma County and five in Napa County. And you remember back BV Inglenook, they also have 1933, 34 Cabernets labeled, but most wineries are still making blends. In 1960, approximately, people started really developing varietal wines and started planting vineyards that were 100% varietal as well, instead of going into the vineyard and hey, picking all the Zinfandel this day and picking all the Karakan the next day, whatever. 1970 to 1988, I put those dates in as the sort of the revolution or the evolution of what we understand to be plants uh, in terms of Chardonnay, which was the most interesting, but it's also important for Cabernet and other varietals as, and, and Pinot Noir as well. And then in 1989, we had the evolution of Phylloxera, so all the vineyards were replanted and today, most of those vineyards are planted to clone. So I'm going to jump off here and I'm just going to uh, explain to you what um, a, a clone and a, uh, a clone and a, and a mass selection. So what happened was back in the day, we would have, you could plant your property and uh, this is not like you guys on a Saturday can go to the nursery and buy a plant. Okay, back in the 60s, you couldn't do that. You had to make your own plants. And I used to put apple on the pear tree. I used to put peaches on the nectarine tree. I used to put oranges on the lemon tree. And my mum would go, she'd come in and go, Christ, what the hell's going on with the plant out there? Well, I know you guys are all watching television because you're Americans. But in New Zealand, that's what we did for fun. We actually, we actually started playing around with plants, mate when we're leaving the sheep alone. We left the sheep alone, we started playing with the plants. Anyway, so we had, it was really interesting. So there's two parts to a plant and you still see this. When you go to the store and you buy a plant, there's two parts, right? There's the rootstock and the scion, okay? So scion and the rootstock. And the rootstock that we were using in those days was called AXR1 and there was another one called 1202. They were the two main rootstocks that we were using. So we could just take a rootstock and we make a little uh, tea in it and we peel back the bark and then we go to the, uh, the when we're pruning the vineyard in the winter, we take a three bud stick and uh, we just, in the, in the spring, we take them out of the cool room, we get our knife and we, we chip the bud out and this is called, it's called chip budding. So we cut the bud out of the cane, we put it into the rootstock, we peel back the the bark, as I said, we slip the bud and we tape it up and we can grow Chardonnay. This was called chip budding. We could do that. 
and we could plant vineyards like crazy until one day around about 1960 1961 some guy some winemaker started going dude this vine tastes different to this vine so they started realizing that within their own field they had different flavors of chardonnay so they said all right we're going to take all the ones that taste muscatty or pineapple and we're going to identify those those four vines and we're going to plant a vineyard the next vineyard that we plant will be pineapple and then the winemaker went in and said you know what these three vines are even more pineapple than the others so they went back in and they made another vineyard and this became pineapple squared okay so this was cool and we had names for these things okay if you think about warm fruit and cool fruit so warm fruit would be like pineapple melon um stone fruit if i hear another winemaker tell me his wine is stone is white peach i'm going to spit it out this is so boring every goddamn chardonnay in the world tastes like white peach get over the shit all right so then we have these other terms structure and texture and then we get pit fruit citrus and then grassy so we had names for these the high-end pineapple was spring mountain rude sea was more melony wenty uh Bado, calera mount eden so these were the names of these mass selections okay everything was really cool until 1989 when phylloxera came along and destroyed the ax01 rootstock any frenchman on the line here okay because the french yet again sold us another lie they told us that axr1 was resistant to phylloxera it wasn't axr1 was vitis vinifera okay there's two forms of vinifera vitis vinifera and vitis labrasca we thought it was vitis labrasca it wasn't it was vitis vinifera and that's why these mass selections when we put them on top of the rootstock they were both vinifera sort of like bob's family you know italians they go along to family reunions to pick up chicks that sort of thing that's how these things were related all right all right so we couldn't use axr1 anymore we'd use labrasca when we took these mass selections and put them on top of the but it's labrasca these things weren't kissing cousins anymore we had a problem we started to get virus we got leaf roll stem pitting corky bug and all these other viruses and some of them the yields went down some vines died it was bad news so the scientists said look we can solve this there's two ways to solve it they went in the vineyard and they said you know what? this vine doesn't show any virus and that became clone one the other way to do it was how i got into grape growing my second degrees in horticulture and biodynamics you take a leaf and you can do this you take a leaf you slip the veins on the leaf you put it on an agar plate and you grow the vine you take the tip you grow the vine you take the tip you grow the vine this is called merry stem tissue culture and what you're doing is you're outgrowing the virus you take that and put it on top of the new rootstock voila no virus clone two definition of a clone you know who your mother is bob okay that was funny all right so i don't like to know who my mother is i like to make well i do know who my mother is likely i like to make chardonnay from these old mass selections because everything tastes the same so the structural wine on your tongue if this is your tongue a structural wine is a wine that comes in the mouth like this and the things that make a wine more structural are carbon dioxide acid the temperature you guys serve the wine at and uh wood okay all those things are trying to make the wine tight on a textural wine you know it comes in the mouth broad and then finishes broad this is ph alcohol sugar malolactic and fruit okay these things are trying to make the wine fatter these things are trying to make the wine skinnier so this is as a winemaker when we blend we're trying to always think about how we're going to make this wine drink i can sell you i can sell anyone in the world one glass of wine but can i sell them two that's the problem and that's why we need to think about how these wines taste you know when you drink this when you drink the chardonnay i hope you tried it with a set in stone when you drink the set in stone chardonnay it goes in the mouth like this you go and you go shit, man am i hungry or thirsty Am I going to have to go back and have another drink? Am I hungry, or I have to eat something? 
And that's something that we'll talk about with the Cabernet as well, because I think Alexander Valley is really unique like that. So clones. The problem with cloning is that we made these grapes safe. And when we made them safe, we bred all the interesting thing out of them. And that's why today, Dijon clones, which you've, you guys all heard about Dijon clones, the French clones, the UC Davis clones, and the Espaguet clones from Italy, they're all the same shit. That's all boring. So when you drink those wines, they all fit here. You get a little bit of pip fruit and you get a little bit of stone fruit. But when you drink set in stone, it's the sea selection, it's the melon. So you're gonna get some structure because I, because I really emphasize the calcium carbonate character. And stylistically, you're gonna get a wine like that. It's much bigger, much more broad, and you'll get that like little bit of passion fruit and melon in the, in the aromatic, and that will follow through into the mouth. Does that make sense? What do you call an Australian with two girlfriends? A shepherd. Any reaction from anyone? <laughs> okay. Hey, Bob, what the hell, man? Are these guys all dead? What's going on? I thought, I thought you worked for my mate, Freddie. You know, I've always dreamed about working with you guys. This is the best evolution that I've ever had in my career. I get to work with you guys because you guys are dominant. Anyway, I hope, uh, I hope you like what I'm doing today and I hope you bring me into the market because I'd love to hang with you guys. I mean, you guys, were, I'm, I met Freddie a couple of times in, my pre, in, in another life, but uh, we won't go into detail. Great guy, though. Love him. All right, so let's, um, I'm going to talk quickly about malolactic because I, I'm, I'm going to bump the slide up here and I don't want to delay again. I want to come off. So people ask me, how much ML is in wine? I'm like, dude, what do you think? Because I always look at them and go, do you understand the science of what that means? Because there are two forms of acid in wine. There's, where's Steve Ripley gone? Has he jumped the fence? Um, so the, uh, there's two forms of acid. There's tartaric acid and malic acid. So malic acid goes to lactic acid. And this is a bacteria. It's a bacteria ferment, okay? This is not like Jack in a Box. This bacteria is safe. You can eat this. Okay, so yeast ferment sugar to alcohol. Bacteria for man, malic acid to lactic acid. It's leuconostol, okay? So if you're in a cool climate, you get four grams of malic. That gives you two grams of lactic. If you're in a warm climate, you get half a gram of malic. Or sorry, you get one gram of malic. You get half a gram of lactic. So which wine is more buttery? Well, this one. So before you ask a winemaker how much ML is in a wine, ask him, how much malic acid did you start with? Because... Until you understand if it's warm climate or cool climate, you don't understand whether it's going to be buttery or not. The second question is, when you ferment sugar to alcohol, the yeast are really happy. But then when you put the bacteria in here, the yeast go into stress because the yeast want the nitrogen, the ammonia. That's their nutrient source. Bacteria can eat it easier. But diacetyl, which produces the buttery character, has a couple of, of uh, ON elements to hang off the benzene ring. So, the yeast can actually eat this. So the thing is, if you add the bacteria during primary fermentation, the yeast eat the butter. So how much malic acid did you start with? When did you add the bacteria? Because if you add the bacteria after fermentation, you get more butter. If you add the bacteria during fermentation, you get less butter. What temperature did you ferment it at? If you ferment hot, less butter. If you ferment cold, more butter. Do you leave the wine on leaves? If you leave the wine on lees, you get less butter. If you rack it off the lees and put it back in barrel, more butter. And then, of course, do you add citric and malic? Because some winemakers do that. Some of those big, fat, buttery Chardonnays you get from Napa, the winemaker twists the wine by adding, they actually add malic acid. And you add a bit of citric and it gives you even more butter. Anyway, off the record. But next time, these are the questions that winemakers don't like to answer because they don't know how. How much ML is in your wine? How much wood is in your wine? What alcohol is it? These are all questions that, unless you understand the science, don't ask the question. You need to just say, hey, I like the texture, I like the weight, how much malic acid was in the wine when you started, and things like that. Just really uh, bring that out. So it's a kind of a tricky thing, and it's not easy to answer, and that's why winemakers try to avoid that. Does that make sense? A little bit? 
If you want to see some of these in more detail, I've got them on my YouTube channel that I can send Bob the links for. Um, so I've got about uh, 50 or 60 of these educational videos. I've got like 50 or 60 of these charts that if you want to see them, I can send them to your accounts or whatever in more detail. All right, let's jump back on uh, uh, where we were. So just finishing on mass selection, here's the most important piece of clones. Mass selections were selected for two main reasons. Larger yields, faster accumulator of sugar. That's why they were chosen. They were not chosen for quality. So unfortunately with the mass selections, we have smaller yields and smaller berries and thicker skins. So these wines tend to, these vineyards tend to be more expensive. The other thing, and this is really hard to explain, is they're super old. We talk about old vine Zin, sometimes we talk about old vine Cabernet, but we never talk about old vine Chardonnay. And I think old vine Chardonnay is equally as impressive in terms of natural balance, etc. And I really, I look, those are the sort of vineyards I look for. Picking Chardonnay out here in the Russian River today. The guys are sorting through it. Beautiful, uh, beautiful old vineyard. We're just wrapping up here and should get this fruit into the vineyard at the winery in the next uh, hour or so. It'll be fantastic. This is some of the best Chardonnay that we make. And uh, you can see we've got big berries and small berries going in, in the same cluster. And this is what mass selection uh, Chardonnay is all about. It's beautiful, beautiful fruit. A little uh, melon and, and uh, sub subtropical characters will come from this. Fantastic. No clones here, no clones. Yeah, so if you were to see a cluster from uh, a clone vineyard, the berries would all be the same size and they'd all be big. Uh, I think we've covered the ML, so we don't need to go on about that. Right, let's jump into Cabernet. And again, we're looking at, uh, you saw the slope earlier, and we'll, we'll have another quick look at that. But basically, the, I, I'm really fussy about being east face on red grapes because red grapes stay out there a little bit longer. And so we really want to avoid uh, having um, afternoon heat because we don't want raisining and dehydration, especially as we get lim uh, less and less water in the vineyards, believe it or not. Cane pruning, of course, is important. And then over in the winery, we give a minimum of three weeks skin contact because I'm super nerdy about stability. Uh, you know how wines move from purple to red to brown to orange, especially in Southern Glazers Warehouse. The, uh, we try to keep our wines purple and red. We don't want them to go brown or orange. You will never see crusty shit on my bottles. And uh, I'll explain that in a, in a minute as we go through it. So this is a, 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 a drone video of the vineyard that I was talking about. So this piece here has got way more canopy and less crop. And this is where we make the dense wines from. So this vineyard is basically undercropped. And I'll explain what that means. Because the vineyard, the vine has more energy. It's sucking, it's got a big canopy. So it's drawing a lot of water from the ground. And then when we run out of time, it'll draw it from the cluster. And that's when we get dehydration. This is what we call the powerful part of the vineyard, and this is what we call the elegant part of the vineyard. So this, these vines here are overcropped, so we have to drop a lot of the crop on the ground in this little small area here. And we always take this little um, loop here because uh, this is the last photo I ever had of my Suburban before my daughter smashed it um, the following day. So uh, if you're feeling sorry for me, I'll send you some photos of my little daughter who's still trying to work off to pay her insurance that uh, she screwed up. Anyway, uh, that's my little black suburban. Good morning from so Set in Stone, Cabernet Sauvignon, Alexander Valley. This is the day before harvest. Little east facing slope, which we like, of course, because that's morning sun. We don't get uh, too much of the afternoon burn as we do on some vineyards, but this is perfect. Relatively old vineyard, planted in 1989. But this just beautiful hillside, just amazing. Let's uh, zoom in and check out a cluster or two. And so we can see we've got beautiful, loose, open clusters. So nice, even ripening. And the yield here, believe it or not, is about two and a half ton an acre. So very low yield. Anyway, this is Set in Stone Cabernet Sauvignon in the Alexander Valley. Just a beautiful, beautiful day and a beautiful vineyard. So we end up picking this vineyard in, in uh, three parts, G'day. and um, I'm just going to explain a little bit about what that means. I'll just jump off here for uh, for as much time as we have left, and uh, and explain a little bit about 
what how why that is important. So uh, the, the the first chart that is really important for me to understand for me to explain. The reason why I draw these charts is because when I say complexity, what does complexity mean to me? It means quite something quite different to you. So when I talk about ripening, this is this is my chart for ripening. So if this is um, if this is uh, flowering and this is harvest, what we get is acidity does that. All right, this is acid. When acid starts to drop, this is veraison, which is when the berries change color, which you know about, of course. At this point, we get an increase in bricks, and bricks is important because that's what converts to sugar. Bricks, bricks is a metric term, but in the light of time, I'm not going to talk too much about that today. Flavor starts off relatively low and increases as we get closer to harvest, and tannins move from green to dusty to dry to ripe, and where these three things meet in Bordeaux is 100 days. Okay, this never happens, because if this happened, you wouldn't need winemakers going into the vineyard. We could just make wine by GCMS. So in a heavy crop, tannins take longer to ripen relative to flavor. And in a low crop, flavor takes longer to ripen relative to tannin. So we are lucky because in Napa Valley, we can hit 135 days from bloom to harvest. And in Alexander Valley, we can actually hit 145 days because Alexander Valley is cooler than the Napa Valley. And that's why Alexander Valley tends to have more red fruit, a little bit brighter acidity. When people ask me, when do I drink my Napa wines versus my Alexander Valley wines? Welcome back, Steve. The, um, I always drink the Alexander Valley wines during dinner because when you drink Alexander Valley, it's more fruity and more red and a little bit more acidity. So like I was talking about with Chardonnay, when you drink that wine, you get that, man, I'm thirsty. I've got to have another glass. And then I drink my Napa wines after dinner with the cheese course. I'm a big cheese fan because those wines are heavier and my, my palate's tired now. So that's why I choose to drink fruitier wines with dinner, which is what Alexander Valley is, and then the heavier black fruit wines um, after dinner. Not to say that we can't do that in Alexander Valley too, because I have examples of that. But anyway, this is the basis for that. Uh, all right, so that video that I showed you, you saw that the drone, when we, when we fly the drone over, the uh let's let's sort of make it simple here these vines here will be i, I described as the dense vines because they're a big canopy and low crop and down here the elegant vines where we have small canopy and heavy crop where we have to remove so what i did was and I'll, you'll see this in the video when i first walked in the see me the blend i had to blend the 1986 cabernet okay what did a kiwi guy know about making cabernet Let's put it this way. When was the last time you guys had a really good bottle of New Zealand Cabernet? Can anyone even think of a New Zealand Cabernet, let alone a good one? That would be no. Cabernet doesn't exist. So what did a Cabernet, what did a New Zealander know about making Cabernet? So it took me three months to make the 1986 blend. Well, luckily, 86 was one of the best vintages ever. But then I got to start working with a consultant and he taught me three things. He said, Nick, it's not about... Um, all that you think about in terms of quality. It's about balance. And he said there's three sorts of wines. So on your tongue, there's the elegant wines, which provide the berry, right berry character right up on front of the tongue. The powerful wines, which provide the flesh and the weight, and the dense wines, which provide the structure and the finish. And this is my definition of complexity. And so that's when I started thinking, okay, why is it that all my wines that are elegant all come from the same vineyard every year or same vineyards or same blocks? And that's when we started going out and saying, hey, you know what? This is interesting. This, always, this is always making the elegant wine. So what we decided to do, because I'm an engineer as well, is that we wanted to make the best possible wine that we possibly could from each site. So we changed the winemaking. So in an elegant wine, say this is your tank, it's amazing, they have a lot of pieces of paper with it that have only been half drawn on, so I'm trying to use a little bit more paper. <laughs> so this is your tank. You have the cap, and then you have the wine, and then you have the seeds, and we pump over pulse air, punch down, whatever we choose to do. So if you're in an elegant wine, we, not, we, we almost use standard California wine making, which is 30 Celsius. If you want to convert, you add 15 and double, if you don't know. 
we give them more air, more pump over time, etc., and we extract the hell out of it. And after fermentation, we allow the temperature to cool down to 18 degrees Celsius. Now, in a dense vineyard, if we made it like that, we would make a wine that would be undrinkable. So what we do is we lower the temperature to 22 Celsius, less air, less pump over, and then during maceration, I increase the temperature to 26. And what I'm doing is I'm increasing the polymerization because Bob's gonna freak out because I'm gonna show you this. I'm gonna give you one chemistry lesson. This can, you can use this to impress your kids when you go home. You remember back to your flavanols when you went to school, flavanols and your malvidin 3 glucosides? Because this is what you're selling. You're selling flavanols. All right, this is, this is the one that's in a grape. You remember these things? They used to call them benzene rings, remember? Okay, guys, remember these patterns? You remember these things? You never thought that it would be important, but this is what you sell every day. So the, the malvidin 3 glucoside, which is the carbohydrate which you're selling, is called it's called an anthocyanin. This is purple. When you provide more heat, light, air, and time. That anthocyanin joins on another one. This is a tannin. This is red. When you provide more heat, light, air, and time, this compound gets bigger and bigger and drops out. Crusty stuff. That's polymeric pigment. So if you have that in your wine, unless it's the year you were born, the year you got married, the year of your birth, uh, your child's birth, the year you got divorced, whatever was a significant moment in your life, if it's not one of those moments and you've got crusty stuff on the shoulder of your bottle, get rid of it sell it give it away because not only is that polymeric pigment and the wine is turning orange and brown you're also losing fruit it's not interesting to me this is a fruity product this is something to savor and talk about and enjoy this is not something to suffer through and go oh man it must have been good when i was young this is not the way of wine don't drink wines that are brown put it this way i've been making wine from the same vineyard since 1990 I opened a bottle of 1992 made from the same vineyard two weeks ago. The wine is still red. I know, and we're all going to suffer with this after this virus is gone, Kim Jong-un is going to drop a nuclear bomb on us. And when you run to the bunker and you show up with your brown crusty wine, I'm not going to let you in. When you show up with your set in stone, I know this wine is going to last 20 years because I can show you a wine I made 30 years ago from the same vineyard. And that's part of the beauty of history. That's part of the beauty of working with old bastards like me. I'm not one of the 40 best winemakers under 40 years old. I'm waiting for them to come out with the article of the 50 best winemakers over 50. Maybe I'll scrape in, I don't know. But we have gotta find wines that, you know, drink now and drink later. These things are stories, this is part of life. But we have gotta make these things stable, but at the same time evolutionary without falling apart. And so hopefully one day, We'll be able to sit here and talk about the set in stone 2017 and you're going to go dude i remember that one and we can uh, we can open a bottle and, and see see how it tastes so i'm looking forward to that day oh um any questions at all anyone want to put their hand up am i boring the heck out of you <laughs> all right dustin's still drinking we're good all right, so uh, let's jump back on here where, uh, where we're up to. G'day, Nick Goldschmidt here. I'm sitting here with three glasses of wine and everything we do is single vineyard. And the way we get complexity out of a single vineyard is by choosing blocks and styles or working the wines to the way the vines best exemplify themselves. So when I was young, I walked into a room once at a pretty well-known winery with 200 wines on the table. I'm wondering how am I going to blend 200 wines? I came from New Zealand, I didn't know anything about Cabernet. And so working with a consultant, we figured out the best way to do this is to put them into families. Elegant wines, which are the soft berry fruit wines right up on front of the tongue. The powerful wines, which provide the fleshness and the richness. And the dense wines, which give us structure and power. So when we go ahead and line all those wines up, 
I sorted all the elegant wines together and I made a, I chose the best elegant wines and made a blend. I got the best powerful wines and made a blend, the best dense wines and made a blend. And we had three wines, all from the same vineyard, all from maybe in the same block or not the same block, but all from the same vineyard. And then we made a blend of these three wines and it was the most complex wine that we could possibly make. So today I continue that process with elegant wines we can extract them a little bit more aggressively because we know that the tannins are in lower concentration than the fruit, so we can extract more tannin. Whereas on a dense wine, if we made wine like that, they become too dry and too tannic. So we lower the extraction and try and make the wines more fruit forward. So if I was to drink an elegant wine, I'm gonna get more red cherry, great structure, very forward in the mouth, very, very elegant, very, right but good acidity red fruit and very forward in the mouth the powerful wine i can immediately get it it's more black cherry a little bit of walnut and the mouth is really rich really full powerful not a lot going on in the front of the mouth not a lot going on in the structural part of the mouth either And then the dense wines, much more chocolate, a lot more black cherry, but all finished, very supple tannins, good structure, good acidity. And so when we put the three together, hopefully, and it's never 30, 30, 30, because in a warm vintage, I probably want a little bit more of the dense component, whereas in a cool vintage, I want more of the elegant component. So it really depends on the vintage. And when I put all three together, we get the most complex wine we possibly can from the same vineyard. And that's how we make single vineyard wines really complex. Yeah, because that's, that's, that's a very common question that I get asked. Like, Nick, how do you make complex wines from one site and one variety? Yeah, it's very, it's very easy to make a complex wine using different varieties. You know, you use Merlot for the elegant component, use Cabernet for the powerful component, use Petit Bordeaux for the dense component, etc. To make it only from Cabernet is a little bit more difficult. And then to make it from one vineyard is even more difficult. You've got to have the right vineyard. You've got to have the best possible vineyard you can find to make, to make it uh, like that. So hopefully you can appreciate that with the 2017 Cab. So just to wrap up, uh, 2018 is the current vintage on Chardonnay, 17 on the Cabernet. We've got the, the quadruple V, not the triple V, but the quadruple, the VVV Vintage Variety Vineyard Vegan. This is a real place, real people. This is not a, we are not a negotiant winery. Uh, these, these are vineyards that you can come and please, because you guys are in the North Bay. And if you, I know this is a really difficult time for you, but if uh, September, October, I am always in the vineyard and always at the winery. If you have even an hour or two and you want to just drive around with me early one morning, I would welcome that and you could see the vineyard you can taste the wine and see what we're doing and and uh, a lot of winemakers will tell you that's the worst time to come visit i'm telling you that's the best time to come and visit because i have time to see you as in the vintage this will be my uh 37th eighth vintage or whatever the hell it is so uh i think i i, I know what i'm doing at vintage so I, I i'm pretty relaxed and i'm pretty paced so if you have an opportunity to come and hang with me i'd, I'd love to um, celebrate the vintage by having you right around with me the neighbours for the vineyards are Lancaster, Silver Oak, Robert Young, Alexander Valley Vineyards and Ferro Corona. That's, uh, those are the neighbours um, to this property and I don't understand why I didn't put Silver Oak, uh, Segacio there because uh, Segacio is, is, is right next door but they don't make Cabernet or Chardonnay. Each of these wines are limited release so far but we do have potential to grow because both of these blocks can produce more fruit than than what you're currently selling and set in stone. Bob's got a lot of firecracker under your ass to get you going a little bit more when, when we come out of this area, when we come out of this time, of course. If you have uh, accounts, and I've learned that I think this is, this is gonna be the way of the future, I even consulting now, um, they're shipping me wines from all around the world and I'll actually sit in my office here and do blending with the winemaker sitting in their winery in another country. It's, it's amazing. And I think that our ability to actually talk to accounts one-on-one -on -one or for me and and i welcome this too i can make specific set in stone videos just for an account or just for an individual person they take me two minutes to film it's no problem i drop them on youtube send them to you so please take advantage of that i can do that for anyone at any time so um these are my contacts and uh 
we have a set we we do have set in stone out there and so if you want to send me an email or, or bob's got the contacts too he's got the links as well of course you can contact them through that so uh with that i hope it didn't bore you i um i welcome any questions of any caliber of of uh, just unmute yourself and um and I'd, I'd love to hear from you bob you're on mute mate uh there you go okay any guys have any questions for nick don't be shy otherwise i'll have to tell you another sheep joke wade you still around come on wade how many, how many cases do you total have? production nick uh total production so i can't to be honest i can't remember but i think we did about a thousand cases of, no we did about 800 cases of the chardonnay and about 1200 of the cabernet something like that if i recall I can send you the tech sheets on them. The if you don't have the tech sheets, Bob Bob has they, the tech they sheets. They have tech sheets. We already have them. Yeah, we have. Yeah, them. They the the volume should be on there. But long term, this vineyard can produce about uh, eight nine thousand case of Cabernet and about three thousand case of Chardonnay. So we have plenty of room to grow. And and as I said, it's um I'm paying the the grower. Of course, uh, there was a family situation and the the two sons that i work with have taken over the vineyard they bought out their other siblings and of course they they uh they're hesitant they were thinking about pulling out the chardonnay because it's so old and the yield is low and i'm paying so i've, I've increased the amount that we're paying for the chardonnay just to secure it long term because i think it's not every day you you find a vineyard like this and the quality is unbelievable i just love it so um yeah we've got room to grow in both of course how many states are you in Bob would have to answer that. With this brand, uh, well, you guys just do California, but through Carolina Wine Brands, I would guess, I don't know how many markets have brought it in. I think we're probably in 20 plus states, Carolina Wine Brands. Um, not sure how much anybody's doing or who's really brought it in, but... Um, you know, you guys have tasted the wines. Uh, we brought them in several months ago, probably six months ago now, and they're really tasting great. The cab's really coming around. Man, it's great. Chardonnay's delicious. Um, any other questions? No other yeah, questions. The, um, I just say that California is a, for me, set in stone is, I mean, I'm really focused on making wine for um, for California. Yes, Texas and Florida are gonna be big markets as well, but I want California to be the most important market because this is the first time with the change in the way we live, being closer to home for me is important. And uh, cause I travel nine months a year, but I'm gonna seriously, uh, hopefully cut that down. And I'd love to be in California more. And if I can work with you guys and we could find accounts, I'd really like to develop uh, California for the set in stone brand. Cab's phenomenal. Thank you, William. You Any questions, Roger? Mr. Goldschmidt, I got a question. So I know you, uh, I sold a lot of your wines in the past. I've, I've known you since, uh, God, I got in the business in 2000, uh, sorry, 2003. Uh oh, somebody's got too many. Sorry, got too much feedback going on here. Yeah, Andrew John. Uh, there, we go. there we go. There we go. All right. So, so I've, I've known you for a long time. Somebody. I think Andrew Johnson, if he can go on mute, that'd be great. <laughs> While I don't. We'll get that. Somebody. 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 All right, go ahead. I think I can understand. Might be you, Wade. Again, I, uh, I used to work with the Estates Group. I've sold uh, Snow Petrera for many years and sold, you know, hundreds and hundreds of cases every single one. Um, what is, it, and I'll say this, the Chardonnay, the oak is really integrated right now, so it's, it's showing beautifully. But uh, again, we, we got a, like a $20 price on this wine. Why is set in stone the price that it is where we have Sonoma Gatrera. I know it's again, again, thousands and thousands of cases that have been that, that make for, for Sonoma Gatrera. I'd love to get this at a place where we can actually really be aggressive by the glass 
and, and just gets and gets some more uh, people pouring this. Because again, I, to me, a new brand, getting it out there by the glass is going to be such an important piece moving forward with this brand. And, and, and the wine's showing beautifully. And again, that's the thing to me is like, can you talk about, again, what's the big difference between stomach chair and set in stone, price difference, and if there is any way we can get to it by the glass? Yeah, I'm, I'll answer the first question, then I'll end it, like, hand it over to Bob. Sure. So, Wade, good question. I think I explained firstly that the yield is extremely low and this vineyard is extremely old. Sonoma Catrera is made with clones. You can get seven, eight ton an acre. Your return on an yeah. acre is incredible. The second thing is efficiencies. When you, you know, I always remember, this is a Fred story. I'm not going to tell you who he was talking to, but it was a brilliant story. Uh, somebody asked him, if he could buy a million cases at a two buck chuck price. And the person said, uh, and, and Fred told her the price and said, uh, I'm sorry, uh, as she goes, I'm sorry, Fred, I can't do two buck chuck price uh, with the price you've given me. And Fred sure. goes, well, you, you write me a purchase order for 7 million cases and I'll give you a two buck chuck price. So that's, there's also an efficiency difference. You know, sure. so if you're making, uh, 100,000 cases of one skew, yeah, you can, there's a, there's a big difference in price between uh, the efficiencies of it and making something that's less than a thousand. So, but the old vine thing is the most important thing and, and making sure that this wine is uniquely different. And that's, that's key for me, but we have done some work on pricing that Bob can share. Well, and I'll just say this again, I, the, the wine from day one, having it and then having it again, you know, several times along the way and having it today, Again, it's showing beautifully. Uh, the Chardonnay, uh, the oak is beautifully integrated right now. It's just really a complex wine for, for the money. So it's, 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 it's showing great, it really is. Thank you, Wade. So Roger, um, yeah. just want to tell you that uh, you guys, you're the last two teams in the state that I've done this with, with Nick. Um, and probably the top question is about pricing, just like what you just asked. Where would you want to see the Chardonnay? What could you sell it at? 15. Okay, on a two case deal, you can sell it for 16. Without, so Damon is calling this an unpublished price. That will work. 